Hello. Today's topic for class is going to be reincarnation. So up to this point in the semester, we've been talking about Western religions. We've been talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And now we're making this transition to Eastern religions. And what we're going to see is that Eastern religions do religion in a rather different way than, than they do in the West. It's, it's, uh, it's more than just additional worldviews. There's a, uh, there's a big shift in how religion is understood when we start looking at Eastern religions. So one thing that you'll notice is the Western religions have a great emphasis on uh, personal God, right? You have capital G, God. Uh, whereas in the Eastern religions, generally you're going to find an apersonal divine. And so that's gonna be one of the big differences. Um, you do find in the East, you're gonna find personal deities, you're gonna find gods and goddesses and things like that. But in terms of the ultimate, um, the ultimate divine force is not a personal being. So that's one of the differences that you're going to see uh, generally between East and West. Okay, but what we're gonna talk about today is reincarnation. And reincarnation, which is basically a, a difference uh, in Eastern and Western religions, and again, we're generalizing, but this changes things a lot. A belief in reincarnation, like you find in Hinduism um, and Buddhism and Sikhism and, and Jainism, uh, reincarnation changes things a lot. It's got some really big Im implications. It's not just a difference, right? It's not just that in the Western religions, you've got one and done, and then it's on to heaven or hell, or maybe a purgatory or limbo can be thrown in. Um, and that the Eastern religions have reincarnation. There are some really important implications that follow from this. So to start off, um, if we're gonna describe how reincarnation works, um, let's show this image here. So you can see in this image here, which is a, a nice little um, way of depicting reincarnation that you've got your life and then you die and then you're reborn and you get another life. Um, and you see human to human at the top, you see death and uh, new life, and then you also see the animal kingdom um, at the bottom going on. I think one of the important things to know, though, about reincarnation in the Eastern religions is this is not a good thing. This is not, yay, reincarnation. When I come back, I'm going to come back as a kitty cat or, or something nice and pleasant like that. Right? Reincarnation is not good. Samsara, this endless cycle of, of birth and death and rebirth, is, is a negative, and the idea is to transcend this. Um, and so we don't look at reincarnation as a happy, fun thing, um, but rather as something um, uh, unfortunate, uh, an unfortunate cycle that we are caught up in. So where did it all start, or where did you all start? So basically, we could think about it this way. Uh, we can imagine that at some point along the line, you started off as an amoeba, a one-celled organism, and you were there just being an amoeba and pulling yourself around with your pseudopod, just, you know, spending time as an amoeba, and that was about it. And then you spent, uh, you finished your time as an amoeba, and then you died, and you came back as a trout, and you spent time as a trout, and that was wonderful, and then you worked your way up in the animal kingdom a little bit. And then, I wish I was a little quicker with this. You came back as an armadillo. And so you were an armadillo and you weren't a good armadillo or a bad armadillo, you were just an armadillo. Uh, and you spent some time um, as the armadillo. After your time as an armadillo, then maybe you uh, were fortunate enough to come back as a kid, as a human being. Uh, and so, what you find here is, as all of us now listening to this video, uh, are human beings. And as a human being, you've got great opportunities. Um, you've got uh, moral agency now. You can choose to do good things and you can choose to do bad things. And those things are going to have consequences. Those things are going to affect um, the fruits of karma. But as a human being, it's a great opportunity uh, to, to make spiritual progress and maybe, maybe even set yourself up uh, to work towards enlightenment. It's also worth pointing out, I think, I think it's also worth pointing out that we're not just limited to um, animals and humans in this realm on earth as we understand it. Um, these religious traditions think about uh, 
eons of time and other places besides just Earth. And so it's possible, in addition to being an animal um, or in addition to being a, um, uh, a human being, that you could come back as a, uh, a god or goddess. Um, this is not technically literally a goddess. This is actually my, my wife, but that was the closest uh, thing that I could find. Uh, so you get the idea um, that you can come back as something even more than just a regular human being. Okay, so that's how things basically progress. Now, once you get to the level of human being, as I said, you have moral agency, and so your actions can determine your, your reincarnation. And so if you live a life of virtue, um, if you live a life of goodness, then you can have a better rebirth the next time around, or, or reincarnation. If you go around doing bad things, kicking puppies, um, uh, throwing rocks at children, um, then that's going to catch up with you, right? And there's going to be an effect. Um, and that effect is going to be a worse rebirth. And maybe it's that you're born back into the animal kingdom. Um, maybe then you're going to, you know, someone like Hitler gets reborn a thousand times as a starving refugee or whatever it might be. Um, your moral agency as a human being uh, determines what sort of reincarnation that you're going to have. Okay, so with that in mind, what's the end game? The end game is the idea that ultimately through what we in the West might talk about as salvation or we can think of as enlightenment or moksha or talk about as liberation, awakening, nirvana, right, to get out of this cycle to transcend the cycle of rebirth and be reunited into the divine or to attain nirvana or pari nirvana. There's different understandings of what this means. Um, but that's the, that's the end game. That's the goal that people are trying to, uh, to reach, sort of. So this is, I think, one of the other things that we have to understand between differences between Western and Eastern religions. In the West, you've got one lifetime, so you better get it right. You better figure out how to make yourself ready uh, for the judgment. Um, and this is more in Christianity and Islam. Judaism is a little more complicated, uh, but we find this in the Western traditions. In the Eastern religions, this ultimate goal of salvation, most people aren't really concerned about that. If you talk to your, your Hindu neighbor and ask them about moksha and liberation and transcending uh, the cycle of birth and rebirth, they're, they're not really oriented that way. So for most believers in Hinduism and Buddhism and these others, the idea is to have a good rebirth. So you want to conduct yourself well in this life and you want uh, to take account of karma and make sure that you get a good rebirth. So in Hinduism, maybe you want to work your way up the caste system and get a better rebirth in the caste system or, or be born with more wealth and more opportunities and more resources or, or better health or whatever it might be. And so most people within this are not thinking about the end game, not thinking about salvation, um, but most of them are thinking about a good rebirth. And so that's an important distinction to make because we in the West, uh, religious people think about after this one lifetime, am I good to go? Um, and that's not so much the model in the Eastern religions. So this is gonna have a pretty big impact on ethics then. And so when you think about ethics, um, in the West, we tend to look at things more about getting it right, right? Meeting the standard, whatever that standard is, we wanna get it right, meet that standard, do the right thing. Um, and we're rule oriented, right? There are certain rules and you follow them. Uh, if you've got reincarnation, it's not about doing things perfectly. Uh, since it's not about ultimately attaining the, the, the highest good, the highest goal, um, but making progress. So ethics is really more concerned with becoming better, with becoming more virtuous, with improving your character. And so it's not about following the rules and getting things just right. It's about progress. It's about being better. So you can, you can see this uh, as an example when it comes to rules on food. So you know that in uh, traditional Judaism and Islam, there are some rules on food. And so you know you're not supposed to eat pigs, right? Don't eat pigs, that's bad. God said don't eat pigs, so you don't eat pigs, right? Um, now you may know that in Eastern religions, there's this uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism, there's this principle of ahimsa, right? Or nonviolence. And there, you're supposed to be a vegetarian, right? But we understand that not everyone in Asia, uh, not everyone who ascribes to these religions is a vegetarian. And so in these religions, they recognize not everyone can live according to that ideal. Vegetarianism, that's the ideal. That's the best way to live. But if you're poor, if you're living in Calcutta and you're taking care of your family and you don't have enough really to eat and someone gives you a chicken, you eat the chicken, 
right? And people understand, yeah, that's not the best, that's not the ideal, but in your circumstances, that's, that's what you gotta do, and that, that's fine, that, that's not condemned. Um, now, these are, again, are generalizations, because you might say, well, what about the cow? What about the cow in India? And yeah, you'd be right, right? So there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, um, the ethics of East and West are, are a little bit different in this regard. When it comes to violence, right, um, the idea of ahimsa, right, well, you need police, right? You need police, you need soldiers, uh, you need, um, you know, you need people to act sometimes in, in violent ways to protect others who are being victimized. And so again, the idea is, well, if you have to do that, if you work as a police officer, do the best you can, but the ideal is nonviolence. But try to be better, try to, to live a good life. Maybe next time you'll be in a situation to be reborn and a cast in a situation where you don't have to use violence and you can live according to a higher ideal. And so this is what uh, reincarnation adds to the mix, right? Instead of follow the rules, it's about character development and becoming a more virtuous person. Okay, so um, one other thing that connects with this is uh, when people look at uh, Hinduism in particular sometimes, it's easy to look at certain individuals like the sadhus, right? The sadhu or the sannyasin, and here's a picture of one, um, and think, wow, if that's what religious people do in Hinduism, then that religion must be one where they regard the world as bad, right? That the world, that the physical world and pleasures are bad, right? This is an ascetic, right? Uh, someone who's denying themselves worldly pleasures, inflicting difficulty upon themselves, physical difficulty upon themselves to attain a higher spiritual good. And so it's easy to look at this and think, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to uh, reject the, the physical world, the physical world must be bad. But that's not exactly right. So the idea in, in Hinduism, for example, is that the physical world is good, right? It's, it's fine uh, to be in the physical world and, and there are wonderful things in the physical world and there's nothing wrong with them, they're not bad. But we all know that sometimes you have to give up lower things in order to attain higher things. And so one of the examples is we, we know that physical pleasure is good, right? We all enjoy eating chocolate and we don't like touching stove, hot stoves. Um, and so pleasure is good. But we all know that sometimes you have to forego pleasure in order to attain a higher good. And so college students um, sometimes have to go, forego pleasure, right? They're doing the things that they want to do in order to study and they have to work and they have to do things that are unpleasant, right? To attain the higher good of a college education and a better job um, and taking care of the family. And so um, you can sometimes have to give up things that are fine, that are good in themselves to attain to a higher good. And even when it comes to money, money is good, wealth is good. Um, however, um, sometimes you recognize there's something better than wealth, right? Taking care of your community taking care of your family, helping out people who don't have enough. And so we recognize that as a good and we're willing to sacrifice money in order to, uh, to attain this higher good, to, to, uh, to do something better. Um, and so when you come across the sadhus, these are people who are really committed to a very high spiritual ideal. And so they're disciplining their minds and their bodies to perhaps attain to moksha, to liberation, to enlightenment. And so they take on these difficulties to discipline themselves um, in order to attain a higher good. It's not that the physical world is bad, um, but there is a higher good, and sometimes you have to forego uh, those lower goods to attain to that. Okay, the last implication that I wanna talk about then with reincarnation is if you have this reincarnation view, then typically what you have is the idea that salvation is hard, right? It is hard to reach that ideal. In the Western religions where you're trying to attain to paradise or, or heaven perhaps, um, you know, what you have to do, it, it may not be easy and you might have to have the right faith and you might have to reach a certain level of, of goodness and do maybe do a certain level of good works, um, but you can do it. Anyone can do it. Everyone can do it, theoretically, uh, if, if uh, predestination aside. Um, but in the Eastern religions, yeah, it's getting to that ultimate goal is really hard. Not everyone can do it. In fact, most people can't do it. Um, and so... While Western religions have straightforward truths, right? Um, believe in Jesus, the Messiah, who's come to take away your sins, and you will be given eternal life. Uh, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. And follow, uh, follow the commands of the, of the Quran, and be you know, 
a good believer and you'll get there. But in the Eastern religions, yeah, there's not that sort of just straightforward message that you just decide, okay, I'm going to go with that. Um, and so there, the truth might involve seeing through the illusions of the world um, to understand what it means that you have no self. And in Buddhism, especially in the Zen tradition, there's this idea that you have no self. There is no self to yourself. Now, if you truly understand that, to truly understand that is enlightenment, but to truly understand that is going to take work and work and meditation and study and guidance. Um, and so these sorts of things in the Eastern religions, attaining to this ultimate salvation is going to take lifetimes. Um, maybe at some point you're born in a situation where you can live according to the highest moral ideals and you can study and you can dedicate yourself to this. Um, but this is not an easy thing to accomplish. And so the truth claims in these religions um, they say you have to believe this to attain enlightenment. They're not straightforward things that you can go, okay, I'm going to go with that. But rather, there are truth claims that require lifetimes of meditation to, to understand, to comprehend, and to, to personally appropriate in your life. So these are the things that, that follow from reincarnation. So I hope that brief overview of how reincarnation works was clear. Um, but more importantly, that when you have reincarnation in the mix, everything changes. Um, and you're going to end up with a very different religion. Uh, so don't assume that the way you know we think about religion in the West is how people all around the world think about it, with just a few details changed. No, there's some real differences out there. Anyway, that's all for today. Uh, stay tuned for more lectures, and thank you for being here. Be safe.